list is an absolute good. It was a box office hit. I was the only one that wanted to shoot the picture in black and white. No, the studio did. A powerful film about the Holocaust that for so many was so much more than a movie. They say that no one dies here. They say your factory is a haven. It inspired survivors to share their stories. They stripped him from everything. Educating the world. It wouldn't have happened without Schindler's List. The Shoah Foundation wouldn't have existed. Now, the Academy Award-winning film is coming back to the big screen. I think this is maybe the most important time to re-release re this for Our sit-down with Steven Spielberg 25 years after his groundbreaking movie, Schindler's List. The true story of a Nazi businessman saving the lives of Polish Jews during the Holocaust was not one director Steven Spielberg expected to be a commercial success. I couldn't imagine based on the story that we told, that an audience would tolerate the, just, just the amount of, 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 of violence, you know, human against human, or, or inhuman against human. And, and I, I just couldn't imagine that audiences would allow themselves to go through a motion picture recreation of Os the Oscar Schindler story. I was very surprised. But as you're telling the story, you can't pull your punches because history is history. History is history, and, and if you're making, you know, I, I felt that if I'm going to make, you know, a, a story that represents the survivors and represents the six million that, you know, who were murdered, I have to be as close to the reality of the people that we had interviewed that told us what it was like for them. How many cigarettes have you smoked tonight? Yet Schindler's List became both a box office hit, earning Spielberg his very first Best Director Oscar, but also a historical touchstone. Women to the left! Man to right. Women to the left! What took so long to, to finally do it? <laughs> I didn't think I was ready to tell the story for a long time. Sid Sheinberg, the head of Universal, uh, had uh, read a review in the New York Times review of books on, on, on Thomas Keneally's book, Schindler's Ark, uh, as it's called in Europe and Schindler's List as it was titled for America. And E.T. had just been released and we were all very, you know, happy about the results. And he called me on a Sunday and he said, I want to send you a review of a book I just read. And he had a messenger come over to my house with this review of Schindler's List. And I read it and I th th found it very compelling. But he had gone beyond the review. He went ne the following week and he bought the book for me. And yet I wasn't really ready in my own life because I was making movies about extraterrestrials and movies about, you know, Indiana Jones and sharks. And I was into kind of mass popular entertainment concepts. And I wasn't ready to, to go personal like that. And, and I received the book before I ever made the two personal movies that allowed me to make Schindler's List. The first was Color Purple, and the second was Empire of the Sun. And those, for me, were the stepping stones that gave me the courage to take on a story of, of the Shoah. Shot in Poland were the real Oscar Schindler first employed Jews to run his factory, sparing them from death camps. I can't imagine what it was like to shoot this film. You're in, you're in Krakow, you're in some of the places where this actually happened. Mm -hmm. Um, I know there's, there's cameras around and, and all the trappings of yeah. movie, but the scenes had to have taken a personal toll on you, your crew, your cast. Yeah, it, well, I think everybody felt that we were uh, memorializing something, and it felt to all of us as if we were shooting in a cemetery. So there was a kind of amazing... Um, uh, I guess you just call it a, a equanimity of respect, and it was quiet on the set, and everybody just did their work. No one was laughing, no one was telling jokes, no one was talking about, you know, um, you know, football scores back home. It was really, really one of the most. I've only had this experience twice. One was shooting Schindler's List, and the second time it was very reverential. Was shooting Lincoln. The, the two times that, that I think the entire company came together to pay their respects and how quietly they dedicated their work. But you met Schindler's survivors along the yes, way. Yes, a lot of them. That's a lot of pressure on a director. You're telling yeah. their story. I'm telling their story. But and the, you, yeah. you, have to, you have to make it for an audience, a right. theater audience, but also you want to be true to them, right? Yeah. But God bless the one Schindler survivor that came over to me. Uh, it, it was, uh, I believe her name was Nuisa Nussbaum, and she, it was the little girl that Schindler kissed that sent Schindler to prison uh, for kissing a, a, a Jew, um, 
a bit of an act of sedition, I guess they called it. And, uh, and she was, we invited her, we invited a lot of the survivors to watch their scenes being reenacted. And she, she came over to watch us shoot. And she came over to me and she said, I want to tell you my story. And I said, well, I'm telling your story. She said, oh, that's nothing. That was a tiny part of my life. I want to tell you my entire story of what my life was like, who I am. I want you to see me. And I want to be able to, you tell my story so, so that story can inform everybody about what happened to me and others like me. And she was the one that put into my mind an idea that maybe when this film is finished, I can tell many stories like hers and, and send people all over the world to find the survivors and allow all of them to become teachers. And, uh, and that's how the Shoah Foundation began. The film pulled no punches remaining bound to a brutal history. The emotion of the, the movie itself mm -hmm. shooting it, I mean, the, the scene when the women are led into the shower mm -hmm. and they look at those nozzles, I felt that I was feeling their fear, that moment of uncertainty about what's about to happen. Yeah. How difficult was that scene to shoot? Well, let me, let me just say this. No one acted that day. Mm -hmm. You know, um, professional actors, a lot of them were brought in from Israel to play the, 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 the Jewish characters. Um, there was no acting. I mean, I mean, they took off their clothes and we, we were very quiet and th we led them toward the showers and there was a massive kind of, you know, traumatic reaction that was almost, um, it, it just, it, one reaction inspired the next reaction and there was kind of a virtual panic that really happened in that very dark space. And uh, it was just frightening. And we, we, we did it over and over and over again the entire day. And uh, that was one of, the, one of the moments on the entire film where nobody had to be an actor. Nobody had to, to, to practice their, their, their art, their craft. They, they, they existed in that reality. And they showed all of us who they really were and how they really felt. And you know, violence is a part of so many movies now and suspense yeah. and fear. This movie takes you to a different level of fear and, and looks at violence through a a different lens, if you will. Was that, was that an important leap for you to make? You know, I never thought about the degree of violence I was willing or able to, to interpret and show an audience. I, I probably, I, I, I shot this movie more intuitively than I've ever shot any movie in my life. And w when I was not using my, my mind and I wasn't intellectualizing or I wasn't, you know, wrestling with should I do it this way or that way but the ideas were coming to me so naturally and 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 there was no effort in for me to know what I wanted to do next during a shooting day it just seemed to happen every every shot just seemed to be the only shot that was possible to really tell the truth about that dramatic moment and so it, it's one of the few times I've made a movie where I can look back on it and say I didn't plan anything. It just came out of me, and it came out of everybody. Ray Fiennes, you know, you know, Liam Neeson, uh, Ben Kingsley. I think all of us, you know, that story allowed all of us to tap into our intuitive, uh, uh, you know, selves to be the best we could be in that mo in those moments. Spielberg insisted the film be shot in black and white. You shoot it in black and white. Yes. What was, what was the thinking about that? I was the only one that wanted to shoot the picture in black and white. <laughs> the studio didn't. Sid was fine with it, but everybody under Sid was saying, how do we sell cassette? No one thought the film was going to make any money. And they were going to go ahead and give me $19, $20 million to go to Poland to tell the story, which I knew was going to be uh, over three hours long. Um, and they were doing it uh, knowing that they were, it was more of a public service message, less of a commercial enterprise. But they were hoping they would make some money when they sold the cassettes, because it was a huge sort of, you know, ancillary market for movies in those days, not, sure. not anymore. And, uh, but they didn't think they could sell a cassette if it was in black and white. And at one point that they were negotiating with me, they said, shoot it in color, we'll release the film in black and white, but then we'll release the cassette in color, and I said, no, this is, I don't know the Holocaust in color. I wasn't around then, but I've seen documentaries on the Holocaust, and anybody who's seen any documentaries, they're all shot in black and white. It's my only reference point. And it's, you, you wanted this to feel real. I wanted it to feel real, and the only reference point we had, the only, it, it was contextualized in black and white for anybody that watched a documentary on, on it. So there were a few moments of color, and you know, one of the things as I watched it, 
the, the little girl in red. What was the symbol symbolism there? Well, you know, in the book, uh, Oscar Schindler, and to all the interviews of all the people that, that survived the Thomas Keneally interview before he wrote his book, uh, Schindler couldn't get over the fact that a little girl was walking dur during the during the liquidation of, of, of the Krakow ghetto, and everyone was being put on trucks or shot in the street, and one little girl in a red, red coat was being ignored by the SS. The SS were taking everybody, but somehow they were ignoring this six-year-old child walking down the street wearing the brightest color, it, 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 and yet she wasn't, being, she wasn't being seen. And to me, that meant that the people, you know, Roosevelt and Eisenhower, and probably Stalin and Churchill, knew about the Holocaust. It was a, it was, it was a well-kept secret and did nothing to stop it. It was almost, the Holocaust itself was wearing red and yet we did nothing to bomb the Ostbahn, the German rail lines, we did nothing to bomb the crematoria, where there would, would be many casualties but would slow down the industrialized process of murder for perhaps as long as three to six months, it would have saved hundreds of thousands of lives, and we did nothing about it. And for me, it was like a glaring red flag that anybody, if they were really watching, could have seen. And Schindler. It caught his eye, and that was It caught his attention. That's the other reason it was very important. It, it caught his attention because he looked at that, and it, it, it changed something in him. That moment in his life changed him. The, the real Schindler was a complicated character. Very. He was a scoundrel. He's a Nazi war mm -hmm. profiteer, mm -hmm. um, yet he does this amazing thing. Was, was, it a, was he a difficult character to encompass? Well, he was, he was a grand enigma because he was a character who... You know, he, he was a bon vivant, for one thing. He liked a good party, he liked, he liked women, he liked uh, just the, the high life. And, uh, and he was charismatic, and he, he loved uh, sort of manipulating people into thinking that, that, that they were getting the better deal when in fact he was. And he was a, he was a great manipulator. And, but there was something about him that he didn't share with very, very many people. And that was, he had empathy. In, in, in a world at a time where, em where empathy didn't factor in, in terms of an industrialized genocide, such as the Holocaust was, that here was a man who had a great deal of respect and understanding and empathy, which he hid from his cohorts, his, collab his Nazi collaborators, but he shared with his workers who were all Schindler Jews. This is one of those unfair questions like, who's your favorite child? But, <laughs> but your, your body of work, we're all familiar yeah. with, with, you know, how many places you've taken us. How does this rank? Schindler. This is the most important uh, experience I had being a film director and, and a storyteller um, because uh, I don't think I'll ever do something, anything as, you know, as important in my, to, to my life, the way, the, the way this film affected, personally affected me and my family and Kate, my wife and my kids who were very young and in Krakow when we made the movie. And so this for me is, you know, uh, something that I will always be proudest of. It was an education for you, I assume. Oh yeah, this was a. Bit, although I grew up with the Holocaust being mentioned, my family, you know, wasn't shy about talking about it. They didn't call it the Holocaust in those days. They called it, you know, the Great Murders, and uh, and so I, I and we 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 didn't lose direct family. We lost my parents, lost second, third cousins, uh, in Eastern Europe. But uh, this was something that was that was openly talked about in my home. Did you grow? Was that a huge leap for you as a director? Yeah, it was a huge leap. I think the biggest, yeah, the first leap for me, the first step I really took as a director in telling a personal story, I think, was E.T. That's a very personal story for me. Um, and maybe want to have kids, which I didn't want to have before I made E.T. It could have gone two ways. I could have made E.T. and never wanted to have kids ever <laughs> after that. But these kids were so wonderful. I wanted to be a dad after I made that movie. So that was a huge growth spurt for me personally. And the second one was Schindler's List. Very different movies, but I understand. Right. Personal. Mm -hmm. Personal for him and the actual survivors. What kind of reactions did you get from the actual survivors when they saw the film? Uh, a lot of the survivors wouldn't allow themselves to see the film because they'd already, they'd already seen Madonic and Treblinka and Auschwitz and, and, and Sobibor. And so a lot of the survivors, you know, truly loved and respected the fact the film was made and the film was getting such a profound response, but they didn't have to endure it. But some of the survivors who were able to find the strength to sit through the film, you know, all felt that um, 
No movie, no film could ever equal what they experienced, and yet they were very, very uh, happy that we were putting the Holocaust back into conversation again. But, 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 but I have never heard a survivor say to me, your film was worse than what we went through. Everybody said, your film is, it gets us, get, people are now talking about, they're not forgetting our stories that we must never forget that the Holocaust happened and that's why we're happy you made the picture. But your film doesn't compare to what my experience was, my personal experience was losing everybody I loved and ever knew in my life and being the sole survivor. Nothing can replace that. Yeah, I can imagine. Is there, is there anything that you wish, that you know today that you wish you knew then when you did this film? No, no, I, I just, I, 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 what I'm grateful for and thankful for is the support I got from Kate and my wife. Um, I couldn't have gotten through the film emotionally without her support every day for almost five months in Krakow. She was there? Every second she was there. My kids were all there too. Yeah. Were they on the, on the set during the shooting? Not, not, not during the violent parts, but yeah. during parts that they came to the set to visit, but Kate was there all the time. But she understood the she emotional She understood what tool. I was going through, and I understood what, what it felt like for her to, to see all, uh, to experience what her private hell was watching those scenes being shot. So I, I couldn't have done it without her. Telling the stories of survivors didn't stop with Schindler's List. It was life-changing for Spielberg. He founded USC Shoah Foundation, creating an indelible history of the Holocaust and other genocides, including a visual history archive featuring more than 55,000 testimonies. I'm at an age where I don't know how much long I'll be here. I felt it's important that it's not forgotten. It's an educational component that is uniquely a, a, attached to this film. It is. It is. It. It wouldn't have happened without Schindler's List. The Shoah Foundation wouldn't have existed. And now we're in an era that you know anti-Semitism is on the rise. Xenophobia. We, 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 we all know what, what hap happened in, in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that that somehow we're forgetting? That we're losing the impact of that era. Well, I think it's just that um, you know hate has become less of. Hate's less parenthetical today, it's more a headline. And, and the Shoah Foundation, you know, does its best to counter hate, you know, you know, through, you know, you know, through basically reaching out uh, uh, and trying to teach people about empathy and respect and understanding through testimony, which is why we have 55,000 uh, survivors of the, the Holocaust, as well as other genocides, in our database, and that gets disseminated all over the world. This is a history that might otherwise be, be lost. Th this, this was going to become lost history, yes. Yeah. What do you want? I mean, this is a movie that, I mean, you, you never imagined that this would be a movie they'd be showing in classrooms yeah. in, in 2018. What do you want people to take away from this film, who may not, mm -hmm. they know about the Holocaust, but may not have really focused on it? Well, just that individual hate is a terrible thing, but when collective hate organizes and gets industrialized, then genocide follows. And that, that hate is not something that uh, is, 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 is not to be taken seriously. And we have to take it more seriously today than I think we have had to take it in, in a generation. Today, the archives Spielberg helped create are part of school curriculums. Oscar Schindler, the, what else does it say about him? They say you are good. And so is Schindler's List. It's important to know what it was like during World War II and what it was like for uh, the Jew, the Jewish people during World War II and what they, were, what they went through. And it's also important to know that there were good people in Germany during this time. It's good to talk about these types of things, like these points in history, because history in the past, the past is never going to change. It is what it is, but it's really good to talk about it so that you can really get a sense of what it was like for people in those times. It always can happen again. Like I said, like a lot of stuff still goes on, and like you know, people being afraid to be who they are, and, and you know, other people feeling like they need to take action against those people who aren't what they think is acceptable. And I, I feel like it, it just it help us as a society to. Uh, um, accept those people more than we do now. Have you ever heard of Righteous Among Nations? Grace Monahan has been using the film so as a teaching tool in her classroom for years. I feel that, uh, you know, anytime a group is singled out, a group is isolated, it's going to affect everyone. I think that everybody needs to be mindful of that one person can make a difference. I mean, 
Oscar Schindler, he started out as a man who was an opportunist. All he wanted to do was make money. His goal was to uh, be with women and drink and, and spend money. And before you know it, when he saw what happened, he changed. And he realized that he needed to do something to help all these people who were real people. They weren't just those people. Mr. Spielberg's goal in um, creating the film was to tell the story of the Holocaust and what it was like um, and to share that with the world. Um, as a result, in establishing the Shaw Foundation, um, the goal was to bring those stories of survivors and other witnesses to the world as well and to capture them in perpetuity. Now, 25 years later, you have been liberated. Schindler's List is being re-released, including special free screenings for students. After seeing that movie and seeing what a lot of people went through, it makes me really, really sad. And it's heartbreaking to see what has happened to these people. The fact that um, other people were willing to help other people, even if that meant that they were going to get hurt or killed, which was nice to see, because people nowadays don't tend to really do that. How did the idea come about to re-release it and to remaster it? Well, what happened was it just, you know, we, we had a screening at the Tribeca Film Festival, asked could we, on the, on, 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 uh, you know, at, at the, on the occasion of the 25th anniversary, could the Tribeca Film Festival show the picture. And so we went to this theater, I guess that was called the Beekman, mm -hmm. and like 2,500 seats, and they filled the theater up. And I sat, I hadn't seen the Shitless List with an audience in many, many years, and I sat with my wife, and we listened, and we experienced something I hadn't heard in a long time, which was you could hear a pin drop in that theater. And, and it, it just felt that that audience said to me that we should do something more than just acknowledge 25 years have gone by. Is this an important time to re-release this film? I think, it's, I think this is maybe the most important time to re-release this film. Possibly now is even a more important time to re-release Schindler's List than 1993, uh, you know, 94, when it was initially released. I think there's more at stake today than even back then. Hey, NBC News fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.